Welcome to Mastar for the second deep dive into the northern reaches, where we look at the immediate future for Vestland, and watch me try to figure out where the author was going with it, because the story arc got dropped entirely in the future metaplot storylines, to the point of just talking about Vestland fighting orcs for three years. I'm not kidding, the first Poor Wizard's Almanac has zero mentions of Vestland in the timeline that I could find. In Joshua's, Oslin and Solderfjord get a page each in background. Vestland gets a paragraph. It was presented as the shining star of the northern reaches in the Gazetteer, the nation that pulled itself up by its bootstraps, and everything looked bright. Then nothing happens for over a decade. No further mention of its civil projects, its expanded economy, the coming trade boom from the renovated ports and markets. Nothing. Suddenly, humanoids invade and the Vikings have to fight them. That's all you ever hear again. Well, bugger on that! It's time to do what I do best. Aside from all the other stuff that I do even better, but that's not applicable to this video. I'm Mr. Welch, and it's time to fill in the plot holes. Vestland was presented as the most stable of the three northern nations. It had turned away from its violent past, now with its warriors targeting the monsters and the humanoids within its borders, rather than raiding and pillaging its neighbors. It opened up caravans and trade routes with adjoining states, rather than sending longboats to take what they wanted. King Harold Goodmanson decided his nation needed a modern city that embraced the northerners who had been shunned by other countries, like wizards and dwarves. Roads were built, ports were enlarged, and craftsmen were encouraged to sell their goods abroad. Other parts of the nation followed suit, either out of a desire to share in the increased wealth, because of the necessity to deal with the larger and more frequent caravans, or because the booming economy meant cities could afford to add amenities like basic sanitation. The world was Vestland's pickled herring. Despite the rural areas still wallowing in poverty, the quality of life was slowly rising for all of their people. That was Vestland's story arc, a nation experiencing birthing pains and letting go of the old ways so its people could prosper. It still had to deal with several elements of its past, including a border dispute. The more powerful Jarls traded political power for mercantile power, then most discovered that one creates the other. The nation now has to defend its newfound wealth from its jealous neighbors, and the sizable humanoid population prevents it from fully exploiting its vast mineral wealth. The king is doing his best to tame the wilder parts of the nation, which happens to be the wealthiest in terms of natural resources. But there's a lot of resistance from the monsters living there. Merchants have to decide where to take their goods as Vestlandic markets compete to attract buyers. That's the situation in Vestland. They are experiencing an economic boom because of various factors, including a forward-thinking king, open-minded jarls, the rise of its middle class, and the mineral-rich country starting to turn those resources into coin. It's not a mercantile powerhouse like Derekin or Minerth had yet, it's still years ahead of Oslin and Solderfjord. Its most significant advantage is the larger number of transportation options. It has equal access to the land or the sea compared to the other trading nations, which are limited to land caravans for Derekin mainly, or merchant ships for Minrathad. Then wrath hits, and every nation gets shaken to its core by the events of the war and the fall of the great empires. Apparently this destroys Vestland's economic boon because it's never mentioned again. Nothing except for the fight against the orcs and trolls is ever mentioned again. Vestland gets the second fewest amount of mentions in the timeline, except for Yalarum. Even the half-written Etrugan have more entries. Well, this cannot be allowed to stand. Second edition was Mastara's death knell, but we can fix that. We can fill in the blanks. Where there are plot holes, we can apply plot spackle. It's time to put on the writing hat and to address the immediate future of Vestland. I'm going to use as much canon from the Gazetteer as possible and welding on what I can when necessary. Pick and choose what you want from here on out. Vestland has always been the most progressive of the northern nations. Immediately after it secured its independence in 614 AC, it secured trade routes with Thyatis and Alphatia. Shortly after that, it opened trade with all the other nearby nations like Rockholm and Ethengar. In the centuries since, the country has banned slavery, ended its raiding practices, and created a strong central government that provides numerous enumerated rights to its citizens. While it's still a monarchy, Vestland's population has a voice in the government through the Royal Council. That body is the official advisory board appointed to provide expert opinions on various matters. Specific groups all have a representative, comprised of the various churches, freeholders, merchants, the military, the Jarls, and craft guilds. The king appoints a delegate from each group, but each specific faction will offer their best choice for the council to the monarch. They don't have any official power other than to advise the ruler, but a Vestland king who ignores the council's advice is thought a fool. The king can make his decision regardless of his advisor's suggestions, but again, he hired them for a reason. The more powerful Jarls, especially those who control larger cities like Landersfjord or Haversfjord, will all have their version of the council. The local versions will be more focused on specific concerns. King Harald will have a single advisor representing all of the craft guilds, where Jarl Arnolf will be advised by a member of the Forester, Mining, and Smithy guilds. The councils are starting to communicate with each other, seeking to coordinate improvements to the safe movements of goods and to be able to redirect assistance in times of emergency. 
While this development is still in the rudimentary stages, it is being greatly accelerated by Veslin embracing the training of wizards. The opening of not one, but two magical schools is one of the most prominent indicators that Vestland is leaving the old traditions behind. Where Oslin and Solderfjord are suspicious of magic users, King Harold sees them as essential tools in protecting the nation and carving out new domains from the monsters that plague the interior. Norvik has the more significant and older of the two schools, with Landersfjord opening up a second school because Jarl Arnolf hates being behind the times and is trying to make his cities as important as the capital. These schools are still relatively small compared to even the Collegium Arcanum and Thyatis, but the fact that they exist at all is testimony to Veslin's progressive nature. In addition to wizards, the nation fully embraces the clerics and wise women of their patron immortals. Veslin views all forms of magic as useful in their efforts to become a power player on the international stage. It has been upgrading its infrastructure for decades now, in large part by the nation embracing its dwarven population. The dwarves aren't trusted in other nations and are seen as outcast or unwanted by their own country of Rockholm. Vestland invited them to become part of its culture, gave them full citizenship and rights, and encouraged them to find employment in the various cities. Many craft guilds initially objected to this until they discovered they could hire the dwarves and benefit from their skills. The dwarves aren't welcome in the more rural parts of Vestland, but they've turned their talents to rebuilding large parts of the cities. They are the second largest population in Vestland, but they only account for 10% of its total. They aren't dominating the trades as some had feared, but a dwarven overseer is a common sight in the cities. Through their guidance, the larger cities have expanded their ports, installed sanitation, and switched from wooden buildings to stone buildings. The expansion of the large rivers in Veslin has been a priority in their modernization efforts. The cities along the Vestfjord, Mjarsfjord, and Landersfjord rivers have built their docks to handle larger ships traveling up the waterways. And for those pointing out that fjords are not rivers, there are actual fjords on the map. They share the name of the rivers and change from fjord to river once they widen out further inland. The ports allow ships to load up and sail out into the ocean, even deep inside the nation. The town of Runa is connected to Lake Clintest in Rockholm, and while the Vestfjord River needs widening to handle the merchant ships, when complete, it would allow dwarven goods access to ocean trade. While this is a costly and time-consuming endeavor, it is a priority for the nation. While Vestlanders prefer conducting trade by ocean routes, they can't ignore the overland trade. The problem is that the western part of the nation is played with orcs, gnolls, trolls, and kobolds, and the caravans must be constantly guarded. There are few well-protected routes, and the mountain passes are easily defended bottlenecks that make for perfect ambush spots for monsters. In one case, the king subcontracted, hiring a clan of stone giants led by a Wokani named Jim. The stone giants dominated a mountain pass and would demand tribute from the merchants. The king made this official, allowing the giants to collect a specified amount as a toll from the caravans. In return, the giants must ensure that no one attacks the merchants in the long trek through the pass. This arrangement has worked out even beyond the king's wildest dreams, though the merchants aren't happy about the tolls. For the trade routes not maintained by stone giants, protecting them falls to the home guard, which used to be the Vestlandic army. Vestland is still a warrior culture. Every man and more than a few women are expected to serve some time defending their nation. The Home Guard is known for its lightning response to attacks, its ferocity in battle, and its pathetic wages. The soldiers are expected to serve out of loyalty rather than money. This also means they tend to have low-quality gear, which should be a shame for Vestland. This has been mitigated by the merchants and guilds making sure the Home Guard patrols protecting their caravans are fitted with the best weapons and armor that can be provided. To prevent the guards from becoming too loyal to a particular guild, they're rotated to the nearest caravan every season. And a member of the Home Guard will frequently guard a dozen caravans each one of those belonging to a separate guild during their time of service. Moving through the mountains is tedious, and paving the roads is a significant goal for the king. But the dangers and cost involved in that are too great to be a reality at this time. Vestland's future is bright if they can bring civilization to the inland parts of their nation. The rural Jarls still hold on to some of the older ways, but Vestland as a whole abandoned large parts of their cultures, like the holding of thralls. Every Vestlander, at the minimum, is a freeholder. The nation has extensive mineral deposits, and it's the only nation that uses all five primary coins. There's a practical reason for that. The most common metal in the area will make up the majority of the commerce. The town of Gretestad is famous for its platinum coins because of the numerous mines in the region. In Helaga, electrum is more common than the gold coins for similar reasons. Vestland will only achieve its true potential if it can move into the untamed western regions. King Harold is more than happy to offer domains to anyone who could pacify and settle part of the region. With Vestland's relatively low population of only 160,000 people, this has proven the best way to secure the nation. That is the rise of Vestland. Unlike most stories about nations coming under their own, this is happening in real time. Characters arriving in the nation will find cities with large construction projects ongoing. Roads are being paved, rivers are being dredged. 
the nation is undergoing large-scale infrastructure projects because the king knows it will prosper from them later. Other merchant nations don't see Vestland as a rival yet, but this will change once the country reaches its full potential. It has the nautical potential of Minrathad and an overland reach that would cut into Darakin's market share. Next week, I'm finishing off the Northern Reaches series with a look at Soldierfjord's unification measures, which is going to require another trip to Ace Hardware. Until then, remember to buy your spackle in bulk.